feeling of hopelessness, of the great dream of a future for all of us in America suddenly went very dim and looked very dark. The homeless set up uh, numerous uh, Hoovervilles and they would scoop out a hovel uh, so that part of their uh, um, uh, living area was underground. They did that for warmth in the winter and piled dirt up around it and then put a sheet of corrugated tin or uh, wood on top. And uh, like groundhogs, they would hibernate in that uh, during the winter. What I find um, that sustained a lot of people was that people were that worked, they worked together in their struggle, in their common struggle to survive. Sharing living quarters, sharing resources. Responding to complaints that immigrants were taking jobs from Americans, the city government and many businesses began firing non-citizens. Detroit's Mexican workers, most of them Mexican citizens, were especially hard hit. These people were and sometimes uh, coerced, intimidated um, into returning to Mexico. And so we had what was called the repatriation. Three quarters of Detroit's Mexicans returned to their homeland. Uh, one of the worst things uh, about that era for me was listening to my parents' arguments. After we got in bed at night, they would begin to argue argue constantly about money, argue about sex. After the eighth child was born, my mother was terrified of another pregnancy, particularly after Dad was laid off. And so they would argue. And when Dad was home all day long doing nothing, he was full of energy when he went to bed at night, but Mother was exhausted from the baking and caring for her eight children. So I would lie there, quivering all over, and I'd put the pillow over my head and just pray that they would stop. I felt that we weren't going to make it. Certainly that I wasn't going to make it. I was convinced that I was going to die one night. When that strain got so tight and was about to snap, the unemployment council began to form. And they had them all over the city. Detroit's 12 unemployed councils rose out of the city's ethnic neighborhoods. I remember going to meetings with my mother, who was very active in the Ukrainian organization because she was in charge of this area. I remember my mother always saying, if we want to get anything and to be able to get some things done, that we've got to be together to do this. Otherwise, we're not going to get anything done singly. On the street that I live, Daniel Street, is a communist hall. The very next street and used to have a lot of activities, hunger march to Washington and activities like that and uh, a lot of those people subsequently became active in the union i've often thought uh, that the radical movements wouldn't have had the support that they did generate uh, in the early 30s had there been an alternative the councils were not labor unions but associations organized by the communist party to aid the unemployed we listened to speakers we became speakers ourselves now we had the agitators, but who sat with us, who stood with us. They marched to City Hall, sometimes clashed with police, and led campaigns for unemployment compensation, jobs, and an end to evictions. People at one time were losing their homes. They used to evict them. So we used to go in there, uh, we used to go there and fight for the people to stay in, the, in their homes. I can recall uh, the morning that we were notified that we were going to be evicted. Uh, I was still in bed and uh, the first thing that attracted my attention, my mother was crying and I started listening and uh, became apparent that the landlord was there and was regretting how much he had to do it, but he had to get people, he had a prospect to uh, rent the house and uh, we couldn't pay the rent, and so we had to, had to leave. And uh, sometime a fight would ensue and uh, the younger guys would get on the porch and say, no goddamn body's gonna take anything out of this house, you know? And uh, so the bailiffs would have to go back to court 
then they would send a police, a couple of policemen out the next time to evict you. And uh, after the bailiffs would leave, we would set the people back in. You know, things were going so badly, uh, there were very few victories. There were no victories, as a matter of fact. And, and it's a feeling of exultation that finally you've won one. The poor people of the neighborhood won one. Still, there were 150 evictions a day. One Detroit doctor estimated that one person died from starvation every seven hours. Detroit was paying out more in relief than any city in U.S. history. Our country has cause for gratitude to the Almighty. We have been widely blessed with abundant harvests. We have been spared from pestilence and from calamities. Our institutions have served the people. Knowledge is multiplied and our lives are enriched with its application. Education has advanced. The health of our people has increased. We have dwelt in peace with all men. The measure of passing adversity which has come upon us should deepen the spiritual life of the people, quicken their sympathy and the spirit of self-sacrifice for others, and strengthen their courage. Many of our neighbors are in need from... It was such a feeling of helplessness. My mother felt that there must be something wrong with her personally to have this disaster visited upon us. And she also, I'm sorry to say, in a way blamed my father because she thought really if he got out there and scrounged he could find a job. But there weren't any jobs. And I think in the long run my father's attitude made more sense because there wasn't anything he could do about the situation. But mother just kept thinking that if only she worked a little harder or tried a little harder, or if only she were a little bit better person, that things, things would work out for us. Hoover had committed billions to restarting the economy. It had gone for loans to businesses and for state public works projects in the hope that money at the top would stimulate jobs at the bottom. No federal money had gone directly to the unemployed. Just after New Year's Day, 1932, Detroit's Mayor Murphy went to Washington to testify that the situation in Detroit had become dangerous. Sporadic looting was reported, and the relief system had run out of money. The Ford Motor Company offered loans to some workers laid off from the Rouge and Ford himself loaned the city government $5 million. He urged Americans to be patient, frugal, and industrious, and to plant gardens. Then he grew quiet. He was baffled, confused, and inept in proposing uh, solutions. He talked in simplistic terms that if people were ambitious and get out and work, this would solve their problem. The problem was overproduction and underconsumption, not more production. Your backs were to the wall, and uh, the uh, pronouncement of a multimillionaire was little consolation to most people. It was irrelevant. Desperation rose among the unemployed. In Detroit, their frustration, their anger, and their hope turned more toward Henry Ford father of the $5 day, whose factory had now been shut for retooling for six months. We've been seeing that so many people losing their homes, losing the, a lot of uh, things that they have, and no job. But they felt as though Ford had let them down. And he had. If he couldn't sell his cars, what was he, is he going to continue to make cars and then disassemble them and assemble them and disassemble them and that sort of thing? I mean, where were the jobs going to come from? Henry Ford couldn't end the Depression by himself. But Henry Ford was a useful symbol. Finally, a decision was made that we should have a march on Ford Motor Company. On the morning of March 7, 1932, in sub-freezing weather, 3,000 people set out for the Rouge. Communists had organized the march. Most of the marchers were laid off auto workers, many of them first drawn to Detroit years before by the promise of Henry Ford's $5 day.
When they reached Ford territory at the Dearborn city line, police ordered them to turn back. One of the leaders of the march got up and made a statement and said, well, here we are. We've come this far. Should we turn back or should we go forward in a big, huge crack? Oh, let's go forward, you know. The crowd surged up Miller Road toward the Rouge as police fired volleys of tear gas. Marchers unleashed a hail of scrap metal and frozen mud on retreating police. At gate